you might remember Frank Ordaz from a series of maps that he did in the late 1980s and the 1990s, but you probably already knew his work and believed it from movies like E.T. and Star Wars and Star Trek and NeverEnding Story and Goonies and a whole lot more. Today, Frank Ordaz. It is, a, it is an intense time to have a discussion about things considering the backdrop of things. But it's funny, I was thinking about your story and I thought, you know, if Moses had a burning bush, you as a young guy had a bougainvillea bush. And from yes. what I was reading, it really got down to growing up in East L.A., hard circumstances, but there was something that just triggered you about that, the beauty that you saw, that kind of transcendence, that there was something that connected there for you. You know, what's really interesting is, you know, that that word mesmerizing is from a magician, mesmer, I believe. And I, w and I was... I was taken to another place. It was almost like an epiphany. It, it, it was seeing the wondrous creation, the beauty of the light. I mean, I could right now see them, my mind's eye and just kind of hearing some bees and the light glistening off the petals. And see, I, I think I wrote in my biography that I thought the idea of being rich was having some grass in your backyard. Even We didn't even have a front yard because we lived in a duplex. And for years, we just had brown dirt, and our neighbors would have green grass, so our clothes were always dirty, and their clothes were always clean. And so my idea of being rich was you know, coming in after a day of playing, not having brown marks, but green marks on my on my pants. So, Success is color-coded uh, in that way for you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But this but this burst of color, it's never, it's never escaped me, and, and I'm always now attracted to color because in a very drab world of grays, you know, God's creation has these wondrous, wondrous colors, and you see that in plants and animals and sunsets, but the world is just full of colors. You take the time to look at it, and, and too many people in their busy lives don't really take the time to see what's around them, and I think hopefully now... I mean, the context of our conversation is taking place during this pandemic. Hopefully now people can discover how important family is, how important friends are, how important a relationship to God is, how important uh, that we just don't think solely about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And to know that there are new things that are going to come out of this. There are going to be new discoveries, going to be new understandings, um, and, uh, and new possibilities. And, and uh, that's, I think, what we need to focus on as opposed to, well, why can't we go back to the way it was? Well, life has these changes and adapting to these changes are kind of these new realities. Kind of, I mean, I'm, I'm going to put a little Christian perspective on it. It's kind of like when Jesus died on the cross and then there was a resurrection. There, for a lot of people, nothing seemed to change, but something dramatic happened. Mm -hmm. As we're as we're now coming upon Easter, mm -hmm. and that just changed the world. And 2,000 plus years now, that that one event has changed the lives of of a lot of people, myself included. Mm -hmm. So uh, these changes are here. If, you know, people have eyes to see and ears to ears to hear. And as an artist, going back to that bougainvillea, that that just one moment just opened. <laughs> opened up the idea that to me that there was something bigger than myself that created this. So um, one thing I did read too was uh, your dad. Is he still around or has he passed? Yeah, uh, Yes, he is. In fact, my mom just, uh, she just celebrated her 96th birthday and my oh, dad, my gosh, my dad is, my dad is 91. Uh, yeah, he, yeah. He sounds like I would love to meet him at some point uh, just because I loved that quality of finding he wasn't able necessarily to get to realize uh, a gift in art, though he had he had skills and he had ability. But when he got to see his son, like go to heights unimaginable, I mean, go to you went to you went to the White House for heaven's sakes. Um, yeah, you know, I took I took that for granted at, at one time. And not anymore. And uh, I had a conversation with uh, a, a friend of mine. He was a teacher, 
So I asked him, how come, how come you never uh, pursued art as a career? And he said, well, a lot of it had to do with, you know, with my parents and especially my dad. And he goes, well, how, how's that? He goes, well, my dad, they said, said, you know, you might not make it as an artist mm. and you might need something to fall back on. You might need something to uh, sustain you. And I, you know, Curtis, I never, I never got that from my parents at all. Wow. My dad always said, you're going to make it. God has given you a gift. You need to develop it. And people need to see your work. I had never, ever from my dad ever, ever said, well, you're going to have to be more practical and, and go, go to college and, and do something else. Never. So I, I, from my primary care provider being my mom and dad, I've always had 100% um, support. And that's important because because the life of an artist is a very difficult one, especially now. Yeah. All the galleries that represent me, they're all shut down. One Carmel, Santa Fe. Uh, and so you, you most people aren't thinking necessarily about art right now. They're thinking, okay, where's my next paycheck going to come from? Am I going to have enough food? Am I going to have enough toilet paper? And will, uh, do I have enough money now to pay the mortgage or the rent? Mm-hmm. So he's uh, – so, but, but he never think art. he never wavered he he just they both just steadfastly believed frank's going to make it <laughs> he's he's going to be the artist in the family he's going to do great things and they just held with it the entire time yeah that's beautiful yeah. the the it is and i think as i get older i i i kind of see my dad my dad and i had a kind of a rough relationship but i've i've as a, as an older hopefully wiser mm. man, I, I focus now more on the positive things. And that is something I think that has just really been a major breakthrough is just seeing how an important quality that was. If, it, if he had any other type of attitude towards, towards my work, uh, my, my future would have been different. That's, Absolutely different. Wow. Thanks pops. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the one, the one contrast I was thinking of too was, you end up in a very um, elite world in a way that was integral in the culture at the time. People consume films now so quickly and kind of flippantly that it didn't have it doesn't have the same drama that it used to have. It doesn't have the same ep- epic impact in some ways, even with gobs of CGI and special effects all over the place. It just doesn't it doesn't stop the culture as quick as it did in the 1980s or in the 1970s, early 1990s, where a film was really something that people kind of would chew on more. Um, and so you went from one side of LA and then eventually you end up on the very opposite side of LA in many different ways. Uh, you end up working in Hollywood with the biggest names. Um, I, you have a fantastic IMDB page that I was kind of scrolling through. It was like, wait, you did that too. It was, it wasn't just return of the Jedi or all the star Trek movies, but like Howard, the duck and ET. Oh, don't say Howard, the duck. (laughs) (laughs) Go on, go on. There's, there's, okay. Let's say never ending story. Uh, there's, there's a whole lot of love there or Indiana Jones, temple of doom. Yeah. You had really honed um, your ability in painting uh, to a point where probably everybody listening to this, you have uh, this bucolic image or you have a setting in your mind from a film that you watched. And it was probably from Frank's hand uh, at one point that made and conjured that whole thing for you, um, whether it was the opening scene in E.T., or some of the more dramatic shots that happened in um, some of the Star Wars movies. I mean, heavens, you did the skin of uh, the Death Star. Um, there's a lot of this stuff that had a realism to it and a granularity that all became so believable. Um, they got woven into these stories. Now, you had studied with um, some pretty amazing heavy hitters. But I was thinking about it, too. It's almost like you were kind of grafted into the European art scene by the people that you studied under. Yeah. 
uh, I, I kind of landed right at an interesting time. When I was at uh, USC, I went to Art Center College of Design as well as USC. But at that time, at USC, the, uh, the direction was abstract expressionism. Well, I had studied with a man who was, in fact, I studied with two men who were born at the end of the 1800s. And one of them was essentially trained in the academic period uh, at, at the Chicago Art Institute. And it was the, it was the old fashioned go to the Art Institute. You, you painted live from the model, but before you, actually before you painted live, you drew. You drew for several semesters, maybe several years. And then you were allowed to paint. And after a day of painting, then the master would come in and critique. And then you would repeat this over and over. And you also drew and painted from a uh, plaster cast. So that's the way I was trained. And so it gave me a very solid foundation. And then I, I was mentored by uh, Sam Hyde Harris. And he had a studio next to a Western painter called Frank Kenny Johnson. And he was very good friends with Norman Rockwell. And Norman Rockwell would escape his kind of pristine homespun image in New York and come and play in California with Sam. He would throw these outrageous parties. So he spent a lot of time with with my uh, with my mentor. In fact, there was his painting when I first uh, his name was Sam Hyde Harris. When I first came into his uh, living room, he had this giant uh, Saturday Evening Post painting. And I recognized the cover, and it said to my good friend Sam, you know, oh my Norman. Gosh. And I re- and see you and I see you know I'm 63, so when I was when I was younger, Norman Rockwell was a big deal, and I would imagine to millennials today they probably don't even have a clue who Norman Rockwell is or the the uh, effect that he had on the culture, especially the importance of the Saturday Evening Post as a magazine that essentially introduced Americans to the idea of the American myth mm-hmm. that yes you know the, how, yes. how one should live the good life yes, right and that's how, right how young how young uh, boys would swim at the at the water hole and that sort of thing um, in fact think about it there was a time with the Gibson girl right right Charles Dana Gibson through his pen and ink drawings created this Gibson girl and women would essentially try to recreate that image in, in their hairstyles. And so artists had a huge influence during the early part of, of America. And so Norman Rockwell fit into that, that myth. And so these men kind of filled my head with just this culture. So it, I never, ever considered anything else but being an artist because the, the history of of art and the history of all these people that had come before me that were foundational. Like we, we, I paint on the, on top of the shoulders of these Titans of art. Mm-hmm. It just, it, to me, it was such a rich history. I, I and so uh, that's another reason. I, go ahead. No, I was, th- that was one of the things too, is, is it looking through each person's work, um, whether it was Samuel Hyde Harris or whether it was uh, Luke Eats or Bongart, that, you, I could, I thought I could almost start to pick out traits that you absorbed over time. And I don't know what their methodology was like with you. Did, how, how were you kind of accepted into this world? How did you mesh into it? Cause that, it, that's a pretty rarefied air to start hanging around in. Yeah. Well, again, it has, has to do with my dad. My dad started, started exhibiting my work when I was really young. Let's say, let's say I think I was about 10 years old. And so it caught, it caught the eye of reporters. And so people, I come on the uh, local newspaper and the LA Times, a little feature on me. And then it, it got the attention of, of CBS News. And so a camera crew came and a little Mexican boy is, is, is painting and setting, setting the world on fire. You know, it was just a, a little feature thing. And then there was, my dad started talking to another artist at, at an art fair. This was in San Gabriel, California. And they said, well, you know, your son really needs to learn from a master. And I, and I know somebody who still teaches the traditional way. His name's Theodore Lukitz. And he, and, he, and he showed, he introduced my dad to him. And he showed us his work. And my, and my dad was just blown away. And I was blown away. Mm-hmm. So 
uh, he didn't take uh, children as students, but he saw that my dad was earnest. And so he decided, um, he, he did a trade. My dad would work around his house and uh, landscape or fix whatever needed fixing. And uh, I would be taught by this man. And that's kind of how it started. That's amazing. That's it. Um, yeah. were, the, were they indeed personalities bigger than life as far as when in interacting with them? Did you kind oh, of? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, the, these, these men came from an era where people really respected artists. I think people kind of still respect artists now, but now because of men like Warhol and, and the like, artists are also seen as charlatans. Yep. Anybody and can do it. That, Exactly. Or you just come up with some some art fad or trick, and you can pass that off as art. Well, back in the 30s and in, in the in, in the traditional art, people still thought of these artists like Maxwell Parrish, mm. uh, Lion Decker, these artists like, uh, of course, uh, Norman Rockwell. They they really revered them as really having a talent that the average man could not do. I mean, how many how many times have you heard somebody go, "Hey, I could do that." And, of course, the modern artists go, yeah, but you didn't think of it. So now art is more of, okay, I just thought of something, and then I had somebody else do it. Yeah. But at, at, at that time, the idea of also being able to do it yourself, come up with an idea and paint it yourself with skills of perspective and light and tone and actually painting a, a portrait that actually looked like the person, these things were – they were highly regarded and they still are regarded in, in certain quarters, but not as much as, as they used to be. Yeah, we've, and um, we've definitely moved on to an uncomfortable time where it's like you were saying, there's kind of a gimmick equality to it, but it's kind of vacuous and it could be very empty of intent. And the one, well, the one thing that I'd never get from your work or your mentor's work is any absence of intent you 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 can feel the person you can feel the moment um which is something that really you have to be dialed into that yourself and then you have to dial in a wavelength that you can communicate that to somebody else and it registers which right that is a folks well, that's it, a hard hard thing <laughs> yeah well you know, you know I see. I like Motown, and, and you know, there's, there's that phrase, soul music. Yes, and yes. And people can tell, like when you hear the blues, you go, "Man, that's got soul." And 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 the phrase essentially means it's coming deep from experience. It's coming deep from uh, having lived a life uh, through disappointment, through betrayal, and uh, and and just the, the hard knocks of life. And so the song comes from that deep place as opposed to the superficial oversaturation of image making where somebody will just appropriate mm -hmm. an image or, or maybe even copy the blues. They, they can play it note for note, but does it have that, cr that crying of despair that BB King could translate through, through the vehicle of, of his guitar? See, that's a totally different spiritual soulful expression that hopefully as an artist, translate to in my in my case the medium of paint and uh, it it's it's a, it's not it's not something you can do right away and uh it it, it just requires living life mm. living the disappointments the hurts and rebounding from the hurts um it it's soul it's soul painting but at the know? at the bottom of it too though um it's a, a set of skills that you don't get um in an afternoon or in a year or in several years it's a set of skills that right you and that was the one thing that kind of struck me too is by the time you make it to hollywood oh brother you've you've done some painting at this point you think a lot of times uh younger art students might be still working on their portfolio you have churned more and more work. You had a huge portfolio. You had been working in a lot of different media. And so by the time that you get into the deep end of the pool, oh, you've been swimming for quite a while. You might not have had the same people around you, but man, you've been swimming. Um, so I think that's also, yeah, I think that's also why a lot of people, for better, for worse, start out their kids early in a chosen profession. And, and, and that's good. That's sometimes good and bad because 
parents will, for better or for worse, will uh, dominate their children and get them to, you know, hey, practice your piano, practice your piano. See, I, I played trumpet. I, I, I hated the trumpet, so they, but I got to be really good at it. But they always had to force me to play the trumpet, and uh, I didn't love it. So I still play once in a while, but it's just not something I love. I loved art. I loved everything. And, and it goes back to that Bougainvillea. It goes back to seeing something so glorious, so beautiful. How how do I, in many ways, I'm still kind of recreating that first experience of just seeing that beautiful flower. You would think I would paint more flowers, but I don't. But see this, this beautiful flower uh, and and experiencing this visual sensation that's transcended the physical, transcended more than what my eyes were capturing. It's just, and of course we all have that experience with different things, but for me that it it uh, it just impacted me in uh, in a huge way. So you walk into um, Hollywood. How did that all come about? How did you get your yeah. first, oh. first job? Well, it, well, here's the thing. I graduated from Art Center College of Design, which was in Pasadena. And uh, let's see, Star Wars, let's see, the Empire Strike Back had, had uh, just been finished. And I was in, in my studio in Pasadena, and I literally got a call one day, literally a call. Phone rings and uh, landline. There's no cell phones at that time. And person at the end says, hey, you, we, uh, you were recommended by your college as one of the top students there, and uh, we have an opening because we're going to be doing another Star Wars movie, and uh, would you be interested in the job? And of course, I said yes. So, well, we're going to send you something to paint and see uh, how, you, how you do with that, and if we like it, and, uh, then we'll uh, fly you up here, we're, we'll interview you, and uh, we'll take it from there. And, and so I, I passed both tests, and uh, it changed my life. Wow. It changed the direction of my life. Mm-hmm. So from there, the, uh, uh, George initially had all his, all his uh, effects uh, people down in essentially West Hollywood. And then uh, he moved it to uh, Marin County. I can't remember why, but he ended up in San Rafael. So that's, uh, that's where I ended up moving the Bay Area, because uh, Industrial Light Magic, that was the name of the effects company, moved to uh, Marin County. Wow. So you're working with George Lucas and team. I'm assuming that you really could connect and tap in when they were talking about some ineffable, it's totally in his head type scene. You're both kind of coming from the same place visually to a degree to where you can start to connect in and start to visualize and you could start to materialize what he's talking about. Is that kind of how it works? Uh, well, yeah, George, at, at this, I, I would imagine the, the, the hardest visualizations were the first movie. So by, by the, by the third movie, there was all, already an idea of, of what the sets would look like. So in, in that respect, my job was a little easier. So when we were working on, 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 we get we get about forty five paintings, background paintings for uh, Jedi. So a lot of my interaction was with the art director at that time, Joe Johnston, and then we would meet with George. He would come in and look at the dailies, and we get the yay or nays. And there were times we would come up to where we were painting and give us direction. And then when I was working on the Death Star, on the surface of the Death Star, on the skin, yeah. he would come and look, and look at it and give give direction so he he had a hand but he didn't have he he was not a micromanager at all he just pretty much gave the the vision and the idea thankfully was we hired you because of your skill we 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 really believe that uh you're the person for the job we're just going to let you we're going to let you fly wow. and that was pretty mu- that was pretty much <laughs> The, the mindset there. And so everybody there was extremely talented. And um, we all directed our own shot. Now it's just a company of thousands and every shot is micromanaged. There's guy, there's somebody who's going to paint, somebody's going to design the trees and the clouds, somebody does the building. Just within one shot, you could, you could have a group of people working on di- different elements within a shot. But 
back in 19, 1983, there was just one person, me, working on the shot. And if we had animation, then, of course, the animators might add on top of that. And then if we had any type of flying objects, then that would be added to it. But essentially, I was involved throughout the entire process with the shot. So wow. it, it, was a sm it was a small group effort, nothing like, like today. In fact, that's that's why that's why the films films are actually more expensive to produce today than than back then because you have a larger team of of individuals who are working on on different layers of the shot. So there's just that much more people to pay and makes that much more expensive. And there's and for that reason, a lot of the jobs have left the country. There's ILM. Now in Vancouver, uh, London, and also in Singapore. Last time I heard. Interesting. So, uh, yeah. So you go from Jedi, and then word gets out, and you start getting more and more jobs where you're providing these the background mat images um, for a lot well, of important. Well, no, things. no, I was an I was an I was an employee there. So oh, okay. So I got yeah. So I got hired uh, to work in Industrial Light and Magic, and so. But, you know, the first thing I worked on was opening the ET. And then after that, uh, I worked on, uh, I can't remember if I worked on Rathacon, the Star Trek, or if I worked on Jedi. Uh, I, I forgot the sequence. But it, but as an employee, we just, we just kept working on movie after movie. And back in that, in that early 80s, uh, Industrial Light and Magic was, was the dominant player in, in the effects world. So if any movie needed special effects, we were we were the top it's, dog. Wow, now, that's yeah, cool. now it's a, yeah. There were other competitors, but nothing nothing like Industrial Light and Magic. So uh, we got to work in all these premier movies, uh, like all like we. So we pretty much had a contract with Paramount. That's why we did uh, the Star Trek movies, and then any other movie that came down the pipe, and we got all of Spielberg stuff. So any movie that was done by Spielberg, because George and. Mm -hmm. Stephen were good friends, so we, we, that's why we worked on ET, and the reason why we worked on Indiana Jones. So, uh, and then, and, and then, and then, of course, I did a little effects for uh, Back to the Future. I don't know if I got any film credit on that though, but I did. I did one shot for that wow. movie. Okay. And so, uh, yeah. So there's just uh, a whole. We were just the top, and then after that, uh, it all kind of fell apart, and it fell apart because. Um, the digital revolution occurred, mm -hmm. and now people could undercut uh, industrial light magic for effect shops. So you live through the arc of this industry, kind of the rise and kind of change and morph. Now, some, somewhere a little bit later on, and part of the reason why I was supposed to be talking with you was you made some maps. And specifically, you did a series of maps um, related to kind of key sports in the U.S. Um, and from what I found, you did a football uh, for NFL. You did a Major League Baseball map for the U.S. And you also did a PGA Tour. How did that all kind of, how did these projects come about? I kind of started my own business. Uh, I always wanted to be an illustrator and illustrate books. Mm. So I started my own illustration company. And uh, I had a client who liked my work, and he said, hey, I, you know, would you ever consider doing these maps? And uh, I've already talked to uh, some licensing people, and, I've, and I've, I, I, I can get licensing from, you know, PGA and NFL and baseball, which he did. I mean, they liked the work, and so they, they licensed these particular uh, maps. Mm -hmm. So that that actually was a really fun project again, because uh, it just it gave me the opportunity to use my gifts in a totally different way, it was a, a lot more pictorial, illustrative. So I can I can use bright colors, I can paint people. Uh, in in the background world, you don't really paint people. Everything is just spaceships and backgrounds and and you know outer space. Yep. So it, it felt really good to be able to paint a golfer and a guy catching a football and and the guy hitting the baseball. Yeah, so and, and so I just I just had a blast doing doing them. And here's a, here's a, a funny 
a little anecdote. Uh, and my, my baseball map has, has appeared in several movies. I was watching uh, Anger Management, oh you know, gosh. with uh, Jack Nicholson yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Adam Sandler. And so that baseball, that baseball poster is in Adam Sandler's uh, bedroom. Oh, gosh. And, and that poster is also in the movie Moneyball. So if you see uh, Brad, if you see Brad Pitt in in his office, that baseball poster He's is right on his wall. There. So how did you how do you get together the data? How did you pull like select images and everything when it came to like let's say the football map or the baseball map? Well, it definitely would have been easier now because you just go on the internet and find images. I'd I'd have to go I'd have to go and buy books, go to the library. Of course, I was a big sports fan, so I had issues of Sports Illustrated and that sort of thing, and just kind of do a little clip here and a little clip there. And I kind of and I put the whole painting together with <laughs> back time, that time using a copy machine. And so I would just have, make copies of these images and, 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 and create them all different sizes and kind of work like a collage with all these little black and, and, and white copies and so I designed it that way. Then eventually, and then I didn't drew it all in once I liked the design. And uh, it was very time consuming. Oh, dude. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, but it would have been so much easier to do it now because uh, I, I could design it on, on my computer and Photoshop yes. and I can resize and it is, so much. Easier. It is ridiculously so. So um, those three maps come out um, and obviously had pretty good success. Was there anything else cartographic that you had that you'd worked on at this point? That, that had to do with math? Yeah. Uh, that was about it. Okay. That, and, and, and eventually uh, we did another map for them, Indian chiefs. Uh, a, co a company was called Worldwide Impressions. And um, so they hired me to do, I think, another map for famous Indian chiefs, oh, and so there's it's out there somewhere. I'll have to find that. So, Gosh. yeah, yeah, and, and what else did I do? I think that was. Oh, then I did a, then I did a, I did a one on um, famous uh, uh, ski resorts. So there's another one out there. There's a skiing one out there, and so I did a lot of the illustrations of a different type of of uh, skiing wow. uh you know guys drop down from a helicopter people who do cross-country skiing downhill skiing uh jumping and that sort of thing so that one's out there if you can find it okay that uh, um i'm gonna on the hunt this afternoon i'm gonna start looking for both of those that sounds great man i cannot thank you enough for your time this has been so generous of you i so appreciate it um I feel like I've, I've... Well, I have all the time in the world now yeah. that we have this pandemic. <laughs> we could do an, an ongoing eight-part series. I think it's a point of day by day. It's because of... Our thanks to Frank Ordaz. You can find him at ordazart, O-R-D-A-Z art dot com. Feel free to contact us if you have questions or requests at newprojectionscast at gmail, and we'll catch you next time.